So the subculture we're going to discuss is that of the zoot suitor. So here we've got an example of a zoot suit. This is one that was assembled by the Los Angeles County Museum of Art for an exhibition about men's fashion a few years ago. And what you're probably noticing right up front is the size and scale of this zoot suit. And um, compare this, of course, when you're reading Malcolm X and his description of his zoot suit and how he talks about it. So you have these uh, voluminous trousers that get pegged or narrower towards the base and spectator shoes, those two-tone shoes that you see there. You have this large jacket with big broad shoulders um, and that's a long jacket, longer than the typical style of men's jackets at the time and certainly the ballooned trousers, uh, which Malcolm X calls Punjab trousers, um, relating them to Indian fashion. Um, those were not the style for the typical man in the 1940s. Um, a bright shirt, a bright tie, and a large hat uh, complete the look. And of course, uh, the watch chain that you can see hanging below um, that jacket. And the jacket itself here has this loud striped pattern. So every element of this ensemble is calculated to grab the viewer's attention and also it's calculated to take up space to take up physical space to take up visual space and this is really key when we're trying to understand what the zoot suit subculture was really about Stuart Cosgrove in his essay, The Zoot Suit and Style Warfare writes, quote, it is in the everyday rituals that resistance can find natural and unconscious expression, end quote. So as with all subcultures, there's an element of resistance here. In the case of the zoot suitor, this resistance tends to be about class and race during World War II. So as with the other subcultures we've talked about, music and dance play a key role in the Zoot Suit subculture. So the dance is the Lindy Hop. And I started out this uh, section with an excerpt from the film Malcolm X, where you could see uh, the performers, including Spike Lee and Denzel Washington. Denzel plays um, Malcolm X, of course, uh, in their zoot suits, um, dancing the Lindy Hop, um, as well as lots of other dancers at the what's supposed to be in the film, the Roxbury Ballroom uh, in Boston. And you can see in these great photographs from the Savoy Ballroom, um, as well as in the clip, that this was an energetic and really exciting dance to watch. And you can see the way that the kind of volumes of fabric, especially in the dancer on the bottom left, um, kind of play into the way that the dance works. So the Lindy Hop was the dance that Zoot Suiters were doing. And they were doing it, of course, to big band music, jazz music. And the subculture also had its own language. Um, so here you're looking at another uh, recreated zoot suit. This one I think was recreated by the Victorian Albert Museum uh, in the 90s. Um, and uh, in this quotation, which is from a 1978 novel, but it's one that's about the zoot suit subculture, um, one of the characters explains, quote, you got to be tricking yourself out like the dude. Get yourself up in some pants with stuffed cuffs, reap pleats, look like a zoot, walk like a zoot, talk like a zoot, end quote. So there's a whole kind of language of jazz that's being used by the members of the subculture. And that is one of the ways to tell who's an insider and who's an outsider, right? So do you know the language? Do you know the lingo? Do you understand what someone else is saying? So this is a way of kind of maintaining the boundaries of the subculture. Cab Calloway uh, is one of the performers who is credited with having at least something to do with the growing popularity of the Zoot Suit in the 1940s. It's not entirely clear how this subculture began or where the style started for these oversized suits. Um, there's lots of different stories that get told by different people, um, but certainly Calloway with his Zoot Suits, which have and he appeared in them um, in films like Stormy Weather, um, helped to popularize the style and spread it across the country. Because of course, you know, people in cities all over the place would have been seeing a film like Stormy Weather. 
Um, and you can see him here dancing in this amazing zoot suit, which cost $185 in 1943, which is $2,535 in today's money. So that is a pretty expensive suit. And that is one of the key elements here. So not only are you taking up visual space, physical space in your zoot suit, but you're using a lot of disposable income to buy that suit. So for a famous performer, a musician, band leader like Cab Calloway, you know, fine, we might accept that he had that kind of money to drop on a zoot suit. But there was this sense of suspicion among particularly uh, white culture um, and, um, you know, mainstream culture, not part of the subculture, about where the kids, the young people who were wearing these zoot suits, most of whom were people of color, where they were getting this money to afford this style. And there was often a sense that it was ill-gotten gains, that they were criminals or something. The truth of the matter was, though, that in the 1940s, many of them had war work. Many of them were working factory jobs or other kinds of jobs that had been vacated um, by older men or um, you know young women going into work, the workforce as men vacated jobs. And so they had disposable income to spend on fashion, to spend on records, to spend spend going out and enjoying themselves places like the Roseland Ballroom. So in fact, this was a kind of myth that developed around the zoot suit. So the zoot suit was particularly associated with um, young Black, Hispanic, uh, and Filipino men. We'll also see women wore it. Um, and I also have some examples of uh, some young Jewish women wearing it. And I've read about Jewish men wearing it as well. It tends to be associated with kind of dif different ethnic um, enclaves, communities of specific ethnic groups. And that would, of course, vary in different parts of the country. So in LA, it's particularly associated with um, Chicano and Chicanas, uh, Latinx um, populations. Um, in a place like New York, for example, I'll show you the case study that I've uncovered of um, Jewish zoot suitors. So uh, it varies from place to place. Um, and in life, in September of 1942, you can see there's a story uh, about the zoot suits. And it's not clear from the story um, if uh, the the men and women who are featured here, and it's mostly it's really mostly the men who are in zoot suits. I see a couple of women in zoot suits, but um, what what their um, their ethnic identities are, um, it's not really a part of the story. But I think it's notable here that um, visually, at least, all of the folks featured in the story are white. So life is not featuring Latinx or uh, African-American zoot suitors, for instance, um, which is really particular. And they're sort of playing this as just a teenage style. Um, but it was something rather different than that. Um, so I want to so I want to show you uh, a clip from a documentary about the Zoot Suit riots that broke out in LA um, in the 1940s. And there were riots around Zoot Suits um, all over the country and cities all over the country um, during uh, the war. And I think that that clip will give you a sense of um, the zoot suit culture uh, among Latinx communities in LA in the 1940s and also um, the ways in which um, that culture um, inspired violence among white young white service members uh, who were stationed uh, in LA. So let's take a look at that clip. When the Sleepy Lagoon case uh, broke and Jose Diaz's body was found, it came at exactly the right moment for the hysteria to erupt. In the 1940s, one Mexican-American kid killing another didn't attract much interest from authorities. But in wartime Los Angeles, Jose Diaz's murder would play out differently. The police department stormed the city's Mexican-American community. Hank Levas was the main suspect. The arrest and trial of Levas and others from the 38th Street neighborhood raised fears that Mexican youth were out of control. Within months, the city would be gripped by brutal racial rioting. 
Mexican Americans would point to the riots of 1943 as the darkest days of their long history in the city of the Angels. Decades of discrimination had forced the Mexican-American community to turn inward. By the 1940s, LA's 250,000 Mexican-Americans lived in a series of tight-knit neighborhoods called barrios. The communities were traditional, conservative, and self-contained. But like many Mexican-Americans of his generation, Hank Levas refused to accept the confines of the barrio. There was a different America outside their neighborhood, and Hank and others like him wanted to claim a peace for themselves. The tensions that arose from this sort of splitting of culture is that often parents really saw their children disappearing from them, from the sanctity of the barrio, from the cultural world, even though physically they remained, they more often were the people that would venture into various aspects of American culture. These kids spoke to each other in English, and it was an English that was punctuated by jazz phrases, cool, hip, on time, all of these kinds of things that they very clearly drew from jazz culture during this period. And some of the boys from 38th Street will tell you they didn't know Spanish during this time. They didn't speak Spanish. The wartime economy put money in the kids' pockets. In 1942, they were spending it on big balloon pants, pegged at the ankle and long baggy coats, a style borrowed from African Americans. It was called the Zoot Suit. The Zoot Suit was everywhere. In the nightclubs, kids in Zoot Suits ruled the dance floor. Their stoic moves, the essence of L.A. cool. All he do is get the girl's arm like that, and she go around him, and he put his arm out this way, and then she go around about three times, and he go like that, because that guy was not going to move. He didn't want to wrinkle the coat or nothing. He didn't want to mess up his pants. As soon as they would get out of the house, they would beeline straight down to Central Avenue. A lot of jazz clubs were. And they would go there to listen to jazz artists and to dance the swing. And all of these things that their Mexican parents would probably not have approved of. And, and they found ways of sneaking around that. And in fact, wearing the zoot suit, I would say, was part of that. Many times I wore my skirt just above my knee till I got around the corner and then I'd roll it up at the waist. And so that it'd be really short, you know. Then coming back from school, we'd just pull them down. The boys wore their pants very wide at the knee. They were always to be 40 inches at the knees and 10 to 11 inches at, at the cuff. So they were very ballooned out, very high-waisted. Their outrageous clothes and cocky attitudes shocked their traditional parents, who feared their sons and daughters were becoming pachucos. In Los Angeles in the early 40s, the word pachuco meant punk. These were ill-mannered kids. These weren't the kids that you wanted your children to hang out with. Many white Los Angelinos felt threatened by their assertive presence. To them, any Mexican kid in a zoot suit was a potential pachuco. By wearing their zoot suits and swaggering down the streets in public, these kids defied the norms of segregation. 
it's hard for us to imagine, but to go back in the context of the 1940s when everything around you told you, not one of us, you're not American, and because you're not American, because you're not white, you're supposed to remain in your neighborhoods, you can't go to our clubs, you can't go to our restaurants, you can't go to our movies, um, and on and on and on, and of course that's going to breed some sort of resentment. The tension on L.A.'s streets was heightened by the presence of 50,000 sailors looking for a way to let off steam before heading off to war. Tensions between servicemen and Mexican-American boys, I think, came from a lot of different places. The first place to look is in terms of the servicemen's own backgrounds. Uh, a lot of these servicemen um, were coming from other parts of the United States. They, had, they were not familiar with Mexican-Americans. And they really were not accustomed to not only the diversity of Los Angeles, but the kind of interaction one would see on the city streets. The charged atmosphere sparked frequent street battles between sailors from the Naval Armory and Mexican-American boys from the surrounding community called Chavez Ravine. Many of the Mexican-American kids during this period came to terms with segregation by seeing their neighborhoods as their neighborhoods. They resented the presence of whites, particularly if you can imagine white military personnel during this period pumped up uh, by boot camp, ready to go out and lick the Japs and lick the, uh, the, uh, the Nazis. The sailors making their way back from a night on the town had no alternative but to cut through a mostly Mexican-American neighborhood. Going down that canyon from the armory, Mexican kids were sitting on the side of the hill as we were walking them down the, uh, the road there. You never wanted to get caught by yourself as a sailor in, in that area by, by going through there in one single file. You're, you're asking for trouble. You're really asking for trouble. At the base, they told us to go down to the sail shop, and, and they sewed 13 pennies in the back of our neckerchief that if any of the pachucos came after you, you take that neckerchief off and use it as a billy club. 13 pennies give you quite a blow, and we all had that. Each fight provided an excuse for the next. Sailors insulted Mexican-American teenagers, and they, in turn, taunted the sailors. The police had their own problems with L.A.'s Mexican youth. During the war years, the LAPD felt frustrated. They were losing their best and most experienced police officers to go off in, into the Army and the Navy and to serve, into the service. And in addition to that, they were faced with this new phenomenon of the zoot suitors. You don't know how many times you heard they were going to take their kid gloves off and they were going to deal with the zoot suitors harshly now. So you can hopefully start to see from that clip the way that the zoot suit was this visual marker for um, white communities, uh, communities that were outside of this subculture that marked the people who were wearing it, the mostly young people of color who were wearing it, um, as being suspicious um, and also as defying the boundaries of what white society uh, expected them to respect. So they were taking up visual space. They were calling attention to themselves. They were showing up in white spaces. And this was an act of resistance against the ways in which um, they were being discriminated against. They were being segregated into these communities. And on top of that, white service members in the case of the communities in LA were starting to move into or move through the ethnic enclaves that they had been, that these Latinx communities had been forced into. Um, so you can start to see the ways that tension developed and the ways that fashion became this really important symbol for um, these zoot suitors of pride, of identity, of community um, and of visibility in a world that essentially wanted them to disappear, right? So they were, you know, declaring themselves present 
The other key factor here in the period of wartime, of course, is rationing. Um, so textiles were being rationed um, in this period. Uh, rationing begins in 1942, um, and the idea there was that textiles were needed for you know, army uniforms and things for the war effort. Um, and so people were instructed and given ration books and coupons to uh, reduce their fabric usage in the U.S. by 26%. And rationing took place in many of the countries that were involved in World War II. But in the U.S., it begins in 1942. And, of course, these zoot suits take up a lot of fabric, right? They take up way more than a regular suit does. Um, their length, their voluminous tailoring, all of these things. Um, and so zoot suiters were going to underground bootleg tailors to get these suits made um, because they were against rationing. So this made them another act of resistance against the idea of pitching in and doing their bit for the war effort. You know, for communities of color, there was a real sense that, you know, why are we fighting this war abroad for freedom when we don't even have freedom at home? So this was a way of resisting the kind of patriotic messages that were coming out around the war in the 1940s through, through fashion and through garments. Um, you're seeing here a few women um, in zoot suits. Um, so I love this photo of Josie um, in Long, on Long Beach Avenue in LA. Um, and you can see um, the way that women style themselves with hair that took up space, um, really uh, bright lipstick and accessories. Um, and you can see that long zoot suit style jacket that uh, she's wearing along with a short skirt. And in the clip, of course, you heard about the girls rolling up their skirts to make them even shorter. Um, so there were many different uh, ways that women styled themselves uh, to be a part of this uh, subculture. And here you can see some other examples um, on the left. A Mexican American female gang uh, who uh, is being photographed uh, in a in a police station um, with uh, their large jackets and hair kind of teased up. They look like they've already been out for an evening, probably gotten into a tussle, and that's how they've ended up uh, in the police station. So their hair looks a bit the worse um, for wear there. This is a really beautiful example from the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston from a show that they did, um, I think a year ago, uh, that was looking at uh, gender bending in fashion. And this is a suit, a uh, constructed suit for a Pachuca, and they based it on this uh, photograph of a woman named Ramona uh, Fonesca um, in her zoot suit from 1944. And here you can see that Ramona has very much styled herself in kind of the classic um, sort of Cab Calloway style of zoot suit big collar, long jacket, um, the little spectator shoes she's got, and then this fabulous hairstyle that kind of replaces the hat and allows her to take up that, that visual space and fantastic, what I imagine is probably bright red lipstick. So women were very much a part of this subculture and found lots of different ways to style themselves, whether it was a more kind of masculine look or a more feminized version of the zoot suit. And here's just another couple of photographs to give you some examples. So this is the example of young women in um, Brooklyn at Abraham Lincoln High School. Um, this is a really interesting story that kind of combines uh, the stories of fashion during the war, um, as well as the rules around fashion and gender um, for young people in the U.S. So Beverly Bernstein, uh, who is not in this photograph, this is a photograph after uh, of students protesting around an incident involving Bernstein. She was 16 years old and showed up to school in blue gabardine slacks and a lipstick red sweater. And she was sent to the office of the Dean for Girls at her school and sent home to change because she was wearing trousers. And she ended up changing and came back. But many students at the school were outraged. 
and they drew up a petition uh, and collected 500 signatures in a few hours. And a number of other young women at the school, those you can see pictured in this photograph, showed up protesting um, the punishment of Bernstein by wearing their own trousers. And if you look at the style, they're very clearly styling themselves in this zoot suit, right? They're um, the voluminous trousers, they're pegging them in, they're making them narrow at the bottom. You've got a couple of young women who have watch jeans there. They've got the big hair, they have the bright lipstick. So they're clearly participating in this zoot suit subculture. Um, and this was a high school that was in um, an immigrant in a Jewish neighborhood. Um, and if you look at the names, some of these women, um, it's pretty clear at least some of them are Jewish. So it's a really interesting example of um, a group of women who are participating in this subculture and who are then protesting at their school for not being allowed to wear the clothes they want. So the protest um, resulted in this petition. And this is what the petition said. Quote, the undersigned want to have official permission for girls to wear slacks to school for the following reasons. A, the United States government advocates slacks for school because they are better than skirts in the event of an air raid. B, they can serve silk stockings. C, they curb sexy clothes such as short skirts. Note, boys also want the girls to wear slacks and are signing this petition in hope that it will be allowed. End quote. So you can see they're using both modesty as well as patriotism, right? They're doing the right things for the war as a way of convincing their school to let them wear these subcultural styles. So it's a really, really interesting story. Um, by March 27th, uh, the dean uh, of schools, so the, the original story happens March 16th. Uh, by March 27th, so about 10, 11 days later, 1942, the Brooklyn Eagle reported that the school principal begrudgingly allowed women to wear slacks. He didn't change the rule, but he said he would ignore the rule. Um, and it's a really interesting story because Beverly Bernstein actually ran away from home because she was so afraid of what her father would think about the incident. So it can tells you a bit about the kind of generational, you know, tensions that exist here. Um, there are many other stories in this period of high school girls trying to uh, wear pants. So for instance, there was a school in Pittsburgh where uh, young uh, men and women both uh, struck to protest women not being able to wear trousers to school. Um, and the Board of Education eventually changed the rules. So this is a really interesting moment in which we see young women um, actually participating in activism to change what they're allowed to wear. And we're gonna see some more of this when we talk about um, style on campuses. So, so stay tuned for some more of this.